Let us pray. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, we pray that you would help us to see Jesus, our hope in him for our family, for our church, for our world. Amen. You know, family is one of the greatest blessings that we have, isn't it? I want you to think back to when you were a kid. I know some of you, it's not that long ago, like now, right? But what is your favorite part, your favorite memory that you have from when you were a kid? All right? I want you to think about that. Hold it in your mind. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you. But just think about that memory. Everybody got one? I'm going to tell you mine. I have two of them. More than that, these are the two I'm going to tell about. One of them was going to Six Flags in St. Louis riding the Screaming Eagle, which was at the time the fastest and the uh, farthest drop roller coaster in the United States, right? Okay, being in Six Flags by myself, I would have been terrified. But I was there with my sisters, right? And I couldn't let them do something that I was scared to do. So I went with them on the ride, and it was a blast being there with all of my siblings and my parents doing something like that, which was very rare for my family, was a great memory. Another one was going to uh, Yellowstone um, National Park and there going to see the geysers, the buffalo, staying in a cabin out uh, on the western edge and my brother and I wandering through the woods, me following him around everywhere, my older brother. And, uh, you know, now I would be scared to death to do that because of bears, right? But we were kids. We didn't know any difference. And we had fun. Why? Because I was with my brother doing things that were fun. We were there as a family. And I'm sure having six kids in a Chevy Impala wasn't that much fun all the time for my parents. But to be honest, I don't remember those. I don't remember dad getting mad at us for being too loud or fighting or whatever because I know we did that, right? But it's those good memories we have of our family. How important that is. All of our memories, most of our good memories goes back to our childhood, right? Whether with our family, our brothers or sisters, our cousins, our grandparents, our parents, whatever it might be. As we look at families today, we know that they are an important part of, of our society. We know that, that it is a, a key thing that we have. There are, are people who say that it is one of the most important institutions of the church that has come out of the church of Christianity is this focus on family and on marriage. So we're going to look today at what healthy families look like. And, and as you, we go through these, I'm guessing that most of you will be going, oh boy, that's not my family. We'll, we'll get to that later on, don't worry, right? But what would a, a healthy family look like? First of all, it is centered in Christ. It begins, uh, John 1, uh, 1 John 2 verse 1 says, my little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. It is about Jesus. A, a healthy family is centered in Christ. We talk about a marriage being a cord of three strands, right? The husband, the wife, with Jesus in the middle. Jesus is that strand that holds the marriage together. We like to focus on that. And then the family gets woven into that strand as it grows, as it becomes stronger. But what's important about that family cord is that it has Christ at the center. It's Christ where we receive our strength. It's Christ where we receive and have our hope. Without Christ at the center of a family, the family's going to struggle. The family's going to, not going to know which way is right, which way is wrong. So being centered in Christ is so important. Second of all, what a healthy family looks like is it is where faith is taught. I should have added to this slide, and caught. Because it's not just about teaching, right? 
It's about catching that faith. And who do you catch the faith from? Our parents. You know, in the church, uh, Cammie and, and Vicar Joel and I have been talking about families and the important, importance it is for getting families to connect with their faith, not just on Sunday morning, but, but throughout the time in their home, whether it's just having a short devotion, reading a Bible study, having a, a family devotion time uh, most nights, having something for that. Because, in a way, the church has taken that responsibility away from the family. And we apologize for that. Because God has given that task to you, the parents. We're to assist you with it. We're to help you in what other way. And don't worry, the church is going to continue to teach your children. But without the parents involved, it's not nearly as effective. So our desire is for that every family to be a house where faith is taught and caught by the children watching their parents as they live their life as, uh, in Christ. It's a, a wonderful opportunity. Even Martin Luther in, in the small catechism written 500 years ago said that, uh, as he wrote it, each part says, as a head of the household is to teach his family, right? Head of the household, not pastor, but we've taken that off and, and we're handing it back in a way, helping you, continuing to teach, but helping you to be able to be part of that teaching as well. So that faith can be taught and caught in the home. A healthy family is also where forgiveness is practiced. In Exodus, the last uh, 10 or so chapters talks, gives the story of Joseph. Joseph was a favorite son of Jacob. There were 12 sons. Joseph was the favorite. Uh, dad kind of spoiled him. The other brothers didn't like it. They threw him in a pit. They decided to sell him off into slavery, telling his dad that, they were, that he was dead. And, and then Joseph, God arranged that Joseph would be the one who would save his own brothers when a famine came into the land. He had predicted a dream that showed seven years of, of plenty, followed by seven years of, of famine. And, and Pharaoh put him over the whole nation as they gathered food in and then distributed it and the, the brothers came to Joseph not realizing it was him and Joseph welcomed them back he forgave them but when his, their dad died the brothers were scared and they said please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you see even if something as horrible as selling your own brother into slavery they repented they turned away from that. They asked for forgiveness. And by the way, Joseph gave them that forgiveness. Free of charge, no problem with that. So faith, uh, is, or the home, is where forgiveness is practiced. It's practiced between siblings. When one does something wrong and you tell them to say you're sorry and for the other one to forgive them, but also as parents. I remember the hardest thing for me as a parent was admitting when I did something wrong, right? I was working on something and it wasn't going right and I got upset, right? And I probably yelled and yelled at them as well. I still remember that. And after I yelled at them, I said, I'm so sorry for what I did. That wasn't right. Can you forgive me? And those words of repentance and forgiveness I received from them it was more important in a way than anything else because they saw that in practice. They saw my willingness to say that I was sorry. And that's what we do is model healthy families, healthy relationships, knowing that in every relationship there's going to be problems, right? But we are able to model how we resolve and forgive. And again, in a healthy family, there is also, it, it, that's where love for others starts. That's where our relationships are built, first of all, between the child and the parents, then the child and siblings, then maybe cousins and aunts and uncles, grandparents, and then it moves outside of that 
to the friends and classmates as they grow older and over time those relationships that we have at the very beginning impact our relationship with others because it's there where we learn first learn what love for others means and that love flows out from us to those around us yeah family is the greatest blessing isn't it but it's biggest headache ever right I grew up one of six kids, two brothers, three sisters, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm, our car trips, long distances, there was a, a reason why we only took three trips out of state my whole life. It was because mom and dad couldn't handle it, leaving that, having us in the car that long because of arguing, fighting, whatever we do, right? But, but yet, our family, as big of a headache as they were at some times, were the greatest source of care we have. And even now, as we are all adults, um, my mom is a, a wonderful caretaker, and very seldom have I seen her put down her foot on anything. She is just a loving, wonderful, patient person. But she did put her, her foot down about five, ten years ago. She said we could not talk about politics in the house anymore because it was causing such big division between the siblings and arguments at, at family times. She said, no more politics, period. And when mom says that, we listen, right? Because that family isn't so good. You know, our families are under attack. There's an article I read um, by a well-known pastor that said that the, the Christian family is the, the last, uh, last bastion against the culture attacks, that the, the culture is continually attacking the families, trying to tear it down uh, at its, at its uh, defenses. But, but I don't see that as the culture being the family's greatest enemy. I see it as the evil one. You know, it's the evil one that's at work trying to, to pull apart families because healthy families are important. Those families that I described at the beginning, um, well, that's what a healthy family looks like, to be honest. There aren't any truly healthy families, are there? We all struggle. We all have problems. You know, the, fan, the devil attacks us with, with stubbornness, with, with busyness, with stress, with loneliness, with divorce infertility, infidelity, so many other things, so many tools he uses to try to break up our families. You know, sometimes I'm sure you, you've thought in the past, I sure wish I could be part of a perfect family. Maybe you look at a family and say, oh man, that is a perfect family. Why couldn't I be like them, right? But know this, there are no perfect families. If there were, we would have seen one in the Bible, right? But what do we see in the Bible? Oh, Adam and Eve, the first man and wife, their family had to have been pretty good, right? Well, no, didn't you hear what we read? Cain killed Abel, brother killing brother. Doesn't sound like a very good family to me. Let's move forward to, well, Abraham. The, the, the father of many nations, the father of God's chosen people, Abraham and Sarah, had to have had a great marriage, a great family, right? After all, Isaac was their child that they waited for for decades. Abraham was 100. Sarah was, was 90 when, she, when he was born. I, I, they had to have been a perfect family, right? Well, other than that part about Hagar where Sarah gave... Hagar to be with Abraham and to have a child with, with Abraham, right? That child that, and, and uh, uh, woman that, that uh, Abraham then kicked out of the house and let them fend for themselves. I wouldn't call that a healthy family either. All right, well then, let's move forward to, well, obviously not Isaac, no. Jacob, no. Oh, David! A man after God's own heart, a man after God's own heart would 
definitely be teaching his children to be the best possible, right? There we go. Or not. One son raped one of his daughters. Another son killed that son. And then that son was exiled for a number of years, came back. David never talked to him. And then that son, Absalom, ended up kicking David out of the temple and leading a rebellion out of him. And David had to flee for his very life. Yeah, that sounds like a perfect family to me, doesn't it? The point is, oh, wait, one more. Jesus' family. Mary and Joseph. Bingo! The picture of a healthy family, right? How many of you parents have ever left your child alone for three days? In a busy city, by themselves. I don't think that's a very normal thing for parents to do. I don't think it's a healthy thing. By the way, other passages record what, what Mary and her brother and, and his, Jesus' brothers, were coming to do for Jesus. You know why they wanted to see him? So they could take him away because they thought he was crazy. Yeah, doesn't really sound like a healthy family. Why am I bringing those up? Because there are no perfect families. I know there are families in this church who are struggling, who have struggled with difficulties, trying to, to work things. They, you might be saying, if only I had that marriage, or if only I was part of that family. But know that that marriage and that family has struggles too. No matter how good we all try to look on the outside, we all have that problem on the inside that the evil one is attacking us all daily. So where is our hope? Where is hope for our family? Is our family's hope in, in new laws that will pass, that will protect families? Or is it in, in different anything like that that we might do on our own? To be honest, our family's hope is only in Jesus. When Jesus was told that his mothers and brothers were outside, he said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. We are his brothers and sisters by faith by trusting in him. You see, our hope is not in what we might do. Our hope is not having the picture-perfect family where everything seems right on the outside, but it's crumbling away on the, in, uh, on the inside. Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in our faith in him and what he can do for each of us. That is our hope. Jesus, being part of his family by faith through the waters of baptism, trusting in him and him alone for the forgiveness of our sins, for restoring us to himself as we live through our broken or strained or hurting or stressed family. He is our hope for each of our families, for whatever struggle we have. And he has placed us in our families to be part of his family here at peace. Our family in Christ at peace is, is centered in Christ. As we gather here together, we are centered on what Jesus has done for us. Every message, you better hear that your sins are forgiven or, or we're doing something wrong, right? Because it's about Jesus that gives us hope, not in our abilities to do right or wrong, not in any of that, but in Jesus and what he has done for us in giving us that forgiveness, in giving us that grace. We are centered in Christ as we gather together in worship, hearing the word the words of forgiveness and grace, receiving the Lord's Supper that he gives to us to strengthen us. 
of our family uh, at peace is centered in Christ and it teaches the faith. It teaches what God says in his word to all ages, young and old. Because we all need to hear the truth that God gives to us. We all need to dig into God's word so that we can remember and know what is right and what is wrong. Our family in Christ also shares forgiveness with one another. You know, we are still sinners after all. Even though we are in this one big happy family of God, right? We are still at the same time saints and sinners and we do things that hurt other people in the church. And when we hurt other people in the church, well, we need to confess to them, tell others that we're sorry, hear those words of forgiveness from them. We need to hear that forgiveness. We need to share that forgiveness. We are also to welcome sinners back. Maybe people who haven't been to church in a while, maybe people who've never been to church. We welcome them here. We show them forgiveness. You know, there's no sin that is too great for our God. There's nothing too great that would tear us or have him say that we are not good enough because his sacrifice covers all of our sin. So we welcome sinners to, to be here so that they can hear those words of forgiveness. We welcome prodigals, those who have wandered from the faith back into our place, not judging them for their absence, but welcoming them with open arms. Our family at peace is centered in Christ, teaches the faith, shares forgiveness, and shows love. Shows love to each other here. Shows love to the people outside our family here at peace as well. My nephew, Jade, just got married to Tori, and now Tori is part of our family, right? She's actually, they, they have a, got married a month ago in Indiana, and now uh, the reception is this weekend um, back home in South Dakota. Um, probably a lucky or good thing that they didn't introduce her to my family before the wedding or, you know, might not have happened, right? But now it's too late for her to back out. But you know what? We welcome Tori in as one of our family into an imperfect, per, uh, an imperfect family welcoming a person as one of our own. And that's what we do as well. We're called to love others who might not be like us, might not have been from this church, whatever. We welcome them here. We show them love. We show love not just to our family, but to all people. That's our calling as a church. And just like our church is not perfect, just like uh, there's no perfect family, there is no perfect church until we go to heaven with Jesus, then we'll see a perfect church. But we work through our struggles and our difficulties, trusting in our God. I want to leave you with uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Um, the Apostle John writes, See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. We are his children. We are loved by God, even though sometimes we might be kind of stupid kids, even though we might do things that are wrong, he still loves us. He still forgives us. He still makes us his own. My brothers and sisters in Christ, rejoice in God's grace that he has given to each of us. Rejoice in your family, as broken and difficult as it might be. Rejoice in this family that God has placed you in so that you might receive his grace and his strength today and always. Amen. And now may this peace which passes all understanding guard our hearts, guard our minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. To him be glory forever and ever.
the one who has made us children of God. Amen. I invite you to rise.